Hey, welcome to Tangible Takeaways, episode 133. I'm Jackson, and today I'm going to talk about how taking sin seriously can be exhausting, but so worth it. I'm also here today with Shane. Yeah, and I'll be sharing why it's important to pray before you read God's Word. All that and more on this episode of Tangible Takeaways. Hey, welcome to Tangible Takeaways, episode 133. I'm here today with Shane. Thanks for taking the time, man. Yeah, man. What's up? Yeah. Uh, had Eric Tonis in this weekend, mm-hmm. uh, which is always a treat. Yes. Um, people do not know uh, what a gift it is that he would make time available to come and speak at our church, mm-hmm. um, but we're very thankful for it. Yeah. Um, super smart guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it comes to Hosea, literally wrote the book on Hosea, like has a commentary on Hosea. Yeah. So um, we're bringing in somebody very knowledgeable to mm-hmm. kick off this series uh, about the specific book of Hosea as well. And uh, I thought he did a great job. Uh, hard book, uh, probably out of many of the minor prophets, a very hard book to cover in just one weekend sermon. It's, you know, 14 chapters. There's a lot going on there and a lot to explain and unpack. Um, but he did a great job bubbling to the surface some of the different themes um, yeah. there in the book. Uh, and he talked about at the beginning how Hosea really reveals to us how seriously God takes our sin. Mm-hmm. And he even talked about that as being a dignifying thing. It's mm-hmm. dignifying that God takes our sin seriously. So talk to me a little bit about when we look at Hosea, we look at the severity, and this will come up a lot in the Minor Prophets, God takes sin seriously. Mm-hmm. Why does it matter that we would know that God takes sin seriously? And why do we need that reminder in the Minor Prophets? I, I think we need to understand why our sin is so powerful because it is, it's taken over our lives. But then when we understand how great God is, we're like, oh my goodness, like this is what I was worshiping this whole time, hmm. and but you still want me, and you're even greater than that. And so I think it's a, it's a big importance to understand too, because I don't think many of us can understand God's true love and grace and mercy until we truly understand the sin yeah. that we're living in right now yeah. and committing. And I think that's why it's such a great example. It's like, I'm gonna use a prostitute. Cause like we all we all look at that like that's disgusting. Yeah. Like what? And then I'm, I'll go and marry her, and I'll have children with her, and they didn't now even go take her back during those moments of chapter three that Eric kind of was going through with us. It yeah. was a lot to go through, you know. And I know he wasn't able to hit everything. Yeah. But just that picture of like oh, because when we all hear that, we're like yeah, that's no. Yeah. But that's how powerful sin is. And you need to understand how gross and nasty it is, but then it also reveals how great God is mm. to still take that person out from that. Yeah, yeah. The greater our understanding of the severity of our sin, mm-hmm. the greater our understanding of grace. Yes. Right. If we diminish the damage of sin yeah. and the seriousness of it, then we also consequently cheapen God's grace. Mm-hmm. Right. It's that much easier to extend grace if it's not really that big of a deal. Yeah. I think we're in such need of the reminder of the seriousness of our sin. The people of Israel were in such need of that. That's why it comes up so often in yeah. the prophets and specifically in the judgment of the minor prophets. But I think we need that because we are so guilty of continuously minimizing how important our sin is and how big of a deal it is. Mm -hmm. Like we are, that's the reason why we continue to sin is because it's not that big of a deal, right? That's what we keep telling ourselves. That's what keeps leading us back into sin. We have all these ways of rationalizing why it's so insignificant. Yep. We justify it. We compare ourselves to others. Well, it's not that bad. I didn't go this far Yep. or everyone else is doing it. Yeah. So become, we're immune to it. Yeah. Or who could even, who, who's really going to be impacted by this? Yeah. Right. Like we, we ask ourselves these hypothetical questions to ease and soothe our conscience to mm-hmm. feel like eh, it's not, it's not really that big of a deal. Yeah. And uh, to your point, comparing another huge way mm-hmm. in which we minimize our sin and all the while, as we're doing that, uh, it's interesting to me, one of the things we never think about really when we are minimizing our sin is its impact on our relationship to God. Mm -hmm. We're normally thinking about, well, I'm not going to get caught. Uh, It doesn't do any real damage or significant damage to people around me. Those are the ways that we tend to justify sin. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think it really ever crosses our mind. Like maybe God doesn't really care. You know, like I think generally we're like, no, nobody else is going to notice. And we just live as though God's not going to care, but we don't even have to think about it. You know, Mm -hmm. like it's not something that we even feel like we need to justify. And what Hosea bubbles to the top is, you know, the term that Eric used, sin is spiritual adultery. Yeah. Like God doesn't take that lightly. And he's not like, well, you know, everybody sins. We've all got our struggles. It's like, that's serious. Yeah. That is a serious offense that wounds the heart of God, wounds intimacy with God, and is something that will not, that needs to be dealt with. Mm-hmm. It, it cannot stand in his presence. Yeah. Like, those are some huge layers of, that's very different than how most of us treat our sin. Well, yeah, because like when he said it's spiritual adultery, and I think it's, dude, he's totally bringing it out too of why God used a prostitute, Gomer and Jose, to marry her, was like, how would your spouse respond? You know, yeah. they would be devastated yeah. if you did that. And that's the same thing that we are devastating God. Yeah. I mean, we're also grieving the Holy Spirit too when we just sin, if we are saying and professing we're a believer. And it's huge. And I think like more of us need that too. And because we've become callous too. Yeah. And so many books, Paul, the Apostle Paul talks about like we have a calloused heart. Yeah. And so now we present ourselves to God with this calloused heart not really humbling ourselves before him or surrendering our sin to him and kind of just going through the motions and then still keeping that back door open to allow the sin to continue to creep in Yeah, and saying, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. No one's going to see it. No one knows. Yeah. Because some of those sins aren't, you know, as visible as others. Yeah. Depending on what they are. Totally. And I think what we have to be careful of too, in the vein of minimizing mm-hmm. sin is we have to be careful of not minimizing our sin in the way in which we repent too, right? Like this is something I catch myself in often Mm -hmm. is I want to get to the other side of repentance so badly that I offer these very shallow repentant prayers to God, like really minimizing my sin along the way Mm -hmm. instead of taking a moment not to sit in shame where I'm just going to continually come back to this as like the reason that I'm worthless and I'm a terrible person, but to take a moment and sit in the gravity of my sin. Yeah before we just move on to everything's better now Mm -hmm. and to take a moment to say no this is this grieves god this wounds my relationship with him this actually would prevent me from being in his presence if it weren't for the blood shed of his son yeah and that is the only way that i even get to be in the conversation right now Mm -hmm. thank you jesus for the sacrifice that you offered in my place because i like a dog returning to its vomit keep coming back to this junk and i'm so sorry thank you like it's your sacrifice and yours alone Mm -hmm. that i get to be in the like our repentance tends to be like god i'm sorry you know it's been a really tough week and it's you know we all struggle and thank you for your grace move Mm -hmm. on you know but like we don't we even in the process of our repentance tend to our default just tends to be minimizing our sin, which is why I think in the minor prophets in Hosea, but all throughout the minor prophets in this series, you are going to see God continually elevating the severity of sin. Yeah. And then, I mean, we have to understand too, because Romans was Romans six twenty three for the wages of sin is death. Yeah. You talk about the, the Proverbs, the vomit and the dog going yeah. back to it and not to be too real, but I remember there was that weird fluba going around. And I was just so sick. Yeah. And for some reason, I was thinking to myself, like, this is what sin looks like. Mm. It's disgusting. You feel miserable. That's how we should face all of our sin and not just, like, compartmentalize certain aspects of our sin to say, hey, not that bad. No, they're all disgusting. Yeah. And it's sickening, and we have to give it up and to surrender to God. Yeah. It needs to be a rigorous honesty inventory of what's going on Yeah. to truly approach him. Yeah, if we're unwilling to take our sins seriously the way that God takes it seriously, then you've got to start tracking the ripple effects from that that failure. Mm-hmm. If we don't take our sins seriously the way God takes it seriously, we will not understand the great immense value of the grace that he's offered us in mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. We will not have a motivation to rid ourselves of it. Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, 
when we keep making passes and excuses for our sin, I don't think it's just because we're so prideful and we don't want to say we've made a mistake. I think some of that's true. But I think a lot of it is because there's still things that I really like about it. And so I can't speak totally ill of my sin because there's still things that I'm drawn to in it. Mm -hmm. And there's still things that I want to, I, like you said, I want to leave the door open so I can come back to them. And you are not going to reach a point that says, I want nothing to do with this anymore. Yeah. Until you are willing to take it seriously and say, this is killing me. It is killing my relationships with other people. And it is, it is damaging my relationship to God. Mm -hmm. And those things matter more than this thing I keep wanting to come back to. And so this is wretched. This is, this be doesn't belong in my life and it, and I'm done with it mm -hmm. and I'm going to begin taking it serious. Like if we don't get there, you're just going to find yourself continuing to come back to it. Yeah. Then there's the other side that the people have acknowledged a sin. Cause Eric talked about this too. Yeah. Of where like, Oh, I, I just can't go to church yet until I get these things right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, no, just go now. It's like the people that want to do better with their health. Like, hey, I got to get my cholesterol down. I need to lose some of that gut weight. Or I just need to be healthier. But before I go to the gym, I'm just going to do like a 10-day clean juice cleanse. No, you just still go to the gym. Yeah. Maybe it might be a light workout, but still go. Like, we make all these excuses. Or when this happens, then I'll do this. Yeah. And then I can get to that next step of my faith, whatever it may be. And that's a problem too. Yeah. Like they've acknowledged their sin, but they realize, oh, I'm such a bad person. I can't, you know, experience God. Yeah. They're well, actually, putting it in their hands to fix yeah, it. Yeah. But it's actually you can. Yeah. And he wants you. Yeah. Which is interestingly, <clears throat> as you're saying that, I'm thinking that's still interestingly a way of minimizing our sin mm -hmm. to say, I'm going to fix it because you can't fix it. Mm -hmm. Like that's how, that's how severe sin is. Yeah. You cannot fix the problem that you've created for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so to take it seriously is to say, woe is me. Like I've got no good options here. Mm -hmm. And to desperately cling and turn to the grace that's offered to us in Jesus. You know, yeah, I think yeah. Hosea is such a beautiful, like Eric talked about reading Hosea, I think for the first time in high school or college, it's such a, as a young believer, it's such a powerful book mm -hmm. when you stumble across it for the first time yeah. to cling to, because it is the gospel so clearly oh, yeah. painted in the old Testament, mm -hmm. you know, the going to the deepest, darkest places and pulling someone from that who keeps choosing to go back there. Like that is, that is the one who seeks and saves the lost. Yeah. You know, that is yeah. the foreshadowing of Christ. Well, yeah. And just that analogy and the example of buying her back. Yeah. Like the pay the price and the penalty that Christ paid for us Yeah, to buy us back through that obedience on the cross. Yeah to serve as our sacrifice yeah. that only we deserved. Yeah. But he f submitted himself to it. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's crazy. I think a lot too, just you, I mean, as I was thinking, I'm like, man, sometimes you feel like, you know what God feels like when you're a parent, mm. cause you're trying to tell your kid not to do something, but then you still have this love and compassion for them. You yeah. Know? Like you feel kind of guilty. Yeah. That like, oh man, Shouldn't be on time, but he needs a timeout, you know, but you still love him. Yeah. That same way that God loves us so much, even though we continue to fall in that sin. Yeah. It just shows the true, just loving God, that jealous God. Yeah. Which was great how he illustrated that. Yeah. He's not jealous of me. He's jealous for me. That's a huge, I think, disconnect mm -hmm. for a lot of people when we talk about the jealousy. Yeah. Of God. Like, yeah. That's rude. How dare you, you know? Yeah. But or it's just God. so undesirable. It's like it's like a weird thing for God to willingly attribute to himself. Yeah. You know, because mm -hmm. our only other context for jealousy is sin. You yeah. know, like there's yeah, not yeah. like a we don't see a lot of jealousy. That's like even even the jealousy that he talked about, like that we see in marriages is often like a jealous husband whose wife has done nothing wrong, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like still like, bro, chill, you know, like so it's mm -hmm. like. We don't have a lot of good context for there is still a good jealousy to be jealous for the purity of your marriage and things mm -hmm. like that. Like there's, but we don't call that jealousy, you know? Yeah. And so, because we just have such a negative connotation for it. So yeah. I thought that was a powerful point that he made as well. I know. Yeah. I love that one. I wrote that one down. I was writing a lot of notes for these ones, but yeah. Yeah. Well, and it makes total sense, right? If God is the supreme being in the universe he is the very highest good mm -hmm. then the only loving thing for him to do for his people and his creation 
is to yearn that they would want him yeah and that they would choose him because quite frankly he has nothing better to offer yep he's as good as it gets mm-hmm. you know so when you do that math it's like wow he really can be jealous in a way that nobody else can you know when you get jealous that way for something or someone else it's like i'm not their highest good yeah. you know like i've got i don't have the grounds to stand on for that mm-hmm. But God always does because what he's longing for is your greatest good to be in relationship to him, you know? And mm-hmm. so it's this, it is, I, I love the point that you're bringing up of the importance that we wouldn't in taking our sin seriously then say, okay, well, I've got to go clean myself up because that misses it completely. Yeah. Misses the whole gospel. And speaking of the gospel, I thought it was another good point that Eric made this weekend. He talked about, just a clarifying point, making sure that our people understood, hey, you're Gomer in the story. Oh, you're yeah, not <laughs> Hosea, right? And I've I've heard I hear Bible teachers bring this up a lot, specifically in the gospels most of the time, but mm-hmm. it's another great example in Hosea. Because it's so funny how longtime believers, I think, are generally most guilty of this, mm-hmm. where they'd be they read the story of Hosea and think, Man, how would I feel if I was Hosea? Like how would I respond to this situation? Yeah. And it's like, you're not, you're not. you know, yeah. and you've got the same thing like w- John 8, the woman caught in adultery. And mm-hmm. they're thinking, man, if I was Jesus in this situation, what would I do? It's like, you're the woman caught in adultery, bro. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. you're not, you're not Jesus in this situation. Mm-hmm. You're not Hosea in this situation. You're Gomer. What I, I don't know, you know, how do we kind of protect ourselves from going there where we start seeing ourselves as the hero all throughout scripture instead of the one who's so desperately in need you yeah. know we see that a lot yeah and i don't know because i think i think eric talked a little bit about it too but even when you go to a movie yeah you know you become this new character like all right you know i'm gonna start dressing like this i'm gonna listen to indie music only and eat chinese food on this day and this, yeah, you know yeah. i'm just i'm gonna be, become this character yeah because you're infatuated by the person and that probably comes across too when you're reading scripture and i think the most important thing to do before you read is pray yeah. Like, Lord, could you reveal to me what I need to see in my own heart right now so I can better worship you and glorify you to bring others to your kingdom? Yeah. Because that's the ultimate goal, right, is to glorify God but to enjoy him forever. Yeah. And that's, I think, a start. Like, don't just start reading something and then just pulling the text out all crazy. You know, like, really. And then even talk to others that probably know the Bible more than you. Yeah. You know, I mean, don't just go in there like, oh, cool. Like, yeah. Like another one too is like when all your sins are Goliath. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. hold on. Yeah. Or taking that text out of context again. Yeah. So there's, there's many ways to do that. And yeah. I think too, because we want to make ourselves feel better. So of course we're going to side with the hero of the story. Yeah. Which is always God and Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, oof, oof, a Gomer. Huh? And we'll find someone else in our life who's a Gomer. Yep. Who needs to hear it? Yes. <laughs> that's And that's comparison. And that, how could I be Hosea to the, to the Gomers in my life? Yeah, and it's like, know. bro, you're Gomer. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, like, I think, I think that's the, such a common <clears throat> misunderstanding in scripture is reading yourself as the hero through mm-hmm. scripture. And Eric, I don't know if he opened up every service this way, but at the 9 a.m., he opened up the service saying... I, I hope you don't come to church just to hear things that are pleasing to you and to hear things that are affirming of mm-hmm. you. I hope you come to be challenged mm-hmm. and to be convicted. And I, that is how we've got to, like, this is what is so interesting about reading the Bible. The Bible is God's living, breathing, active word, mm-hmm. right? We've got this promise that all scriptures God breathed in uh, Second Timothy, Timothy, and we've got that it's sharper than any two-edged sword in Hebrews 4, Mm -hmm. right? Like it is a tool, a weapon, Mm -hmm. and it is going to speak clearly. Yet you can come to scripture and come with agendas to hear what you want to hear. You can come with um, even preconceived notions, things that you're not willing to concede, like maybe that you might be the prostitute in the story, that Mm -hmm. you might be the one in need. And when we come with our agendas and our preconceived notions, it does not make us impossible to, it doesn't make it impossible to hear the voice of God, but it certainly makes it a lot harder to hear the voice of God. Yeah. And that is why I think if you were to look at, as somebody listening, if you were to look at your experience with scripture and maybe compare that to other people's experience with scripture, you might be seeing different results. 
And that might be because you are not allowing room for God to actually speak because you're coming with these notions like Mm -hmm. I'm Hosea, I'm Jesus in the story. And it's like, no, you're the one who is in need. Mm -hmm. And like what you've got to connect the dots on is nobody in Israel as Hosea was doing this was like, oh, this is spot on. Like we are the prostitute. They're like, this is ridiculous, like Mm -hmm. offensive. Mm Mm-hmm incorrect you know like they're coming in all defensive Mm -hmm. it's only in humility that you are gonna find a way to hear god's voice and be led to repentance and conviction but it's going to start with opening up your bible and saying god i'm open Mm -hmm. i'm i'm open to hear from you if there's areas of sin or pride or error would you speak to them would Mm -hmm. you convict me um like and to your point, why would we not pray before we read scripture? Like that is the craziest thing that is not a regular rhythm for many people. As I talk to them and I yeah. like talk about their devotional rhythms, it's not a very normal thing for people, but mm-hmm. it's like you literally have a direct line to the author, the one who has inspired all of scripture living in you, the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, would you would you connect the dots for me? Cause I, I'm not going to connect all the dots on my own and I'm mm-hmm. probably going to make some bad conclusions and bad assumptions on my yeah. own. So would you connect the dots for me, convict me of my sin and lead me towards righteousness? Would you speak to me through this living, breathing word? I'm yeah. open. I, I'm not coming with all of my preconceived notions and all the things that I already know are true. And I know this is your authoritative word and I'm going to let it operate as an authority in my life. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, then I I think you're not, you shouldn't be expecting to hear from God regularly through his word. Oh yeah. You can be all messed up. I mean, I look at the analogy too for the people that like to work out. I mean, I'm in my thirties. So if I don't stretch before, like I do warm before I do a run, it's going to hurt. Yeah. I don't know where it's going to hurt you because I didn't do the warm up. you know, just like a prayer, like Lord, would you open up to me what's going to happen? Yeah. Like, what do I need to hear right now? Yeah. Not just flip the pages and stuff. Because it's it's so important, but we just kind of like, we just, sometimes we, we rush through it. Yeah. Oh, I got to get that things done, you know? And I talked to you, I think last week we are talking about spiritual discipline a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> when I went to go visit you. And um, like I heard someone talk about, like we compartmentalize our time with God. Yeah. And when we do that, we're like, oh, cool, it's a checkbox. I read some scripture, read my version app. Heard someone talk about it. Maybe it took three minutes. I'm good to go. Yep. But really, like, mm, are you, like, like maybe you even shouldn't have read that because, like, that was kind of a self-help verse, the way they even talked about it. <laughs> yeah. I call them Hobby Lobby verses. <laughs> I know a lot of people have them, so I apologize. But yeah. you have those, like, do you know the whole context of that? Yeah. But are you truly honoring and serving God in your home? Yeah. Or just there? Yeah. And, and what does that actually look like? Yeah. What does it actually look like to be a servant of God, to honor God? And to honor him is first to submit yourself to him and realize, like, yeah, I'm not Hosea. Yeah. I'm a Gomer. Because when we do that, that's when we feel our sin is still not great in yeah. our lives. Like, mm, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. So-and-so should hear that, though. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm good. Yeah. How can I be more of a Hosea to these Gomers in, yeah. that I'm surrounded by? <laughs> yeah. It's And it's, you know, we we laugh about it. But, man, I we hear that all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, this is a very common misreading of Scripture, mm-hmm. you know? Um, which is not to say that we shouldn't seek to live like Jesus and be like Jesus, but that we would never become disconnected from the fact that we are the people who are desperately in need of the grace of Jesus absolutely, and the sacrifice of Jesus, Mm -hmm. that if we become disconnected from that, we'll, we'll be very quick to become Pharisees along the way, you know, to say, oh, well, we've kind of got it all figured out and Mm -hmm. all these other people. They're the ones who, it's like, no, I am in desperate need of the saving work of Jesus Christ, his daily grace to me. I'm in desperate need of that. I need it. And how big it truly is. Yeah. I came across this quote by this old Baptist preacher. Uh I was kind of reading up some stuff, but F.B. Meyer, he says this, the love of God towards you is like the Amazon River flowing down to water a single daisy. Hmm. I love it because when you look at the picture at Google, like what the Amazon River looks like from like the Google Maps, yeah. for it, it's huge. Yeah. And then you just look, that's a single daisy hmm. that desiring, like, I need some water. Yeah. And that's how much God is like, look, I'm giving you it all. Hmm. Like in comparisons, right? It's like, man, we are desperate and we can't do anything ourselves. Yeah. We need that grace. But that grace is huge. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because some people think they're like, oh, I can't go to church yet until I do that. I'm like, no, you're putting yourself in front of God's works. I'm like, yeah. let him do the work. Yeah. But you need to be open about it to reveal what you need to be worked on. Yeah. Yeah. It's such an interesting, I, I think Hosea will speak to you differently as you'd expect it to, depending on where you're at. You know, mm-hmm. if you have been walking this for a while, life with God, and you've been plugged in at church and stuff like that, you might need the fresh reminder, like, shoot, I'm, I'm Gomer and yeah. I'm in need. I don't have this all figured out just because my life is much better than it was before I knew Christ and Amen, yeah. things are different. It doesn't mean I no longer need his grace. Yeah. And so I need to be reminded, man, I'm still desperately in need of his grace. And for others who might have that disposition to say, man, there's a lot of stuff I need to clean up, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of broken gospel in America. That's the, you know, American dream gospel. That's like, go work hard and put in the work and then, you know, God will love you and bless you. It's like, no, that's not the gospel. Like it's always been about grace. It was never about Gomer cleaning herself up and working really hard to be better. It was always about the fact that Jesus has been in pursuit of you and me and he's hunting you down. Mm -hmm. So all you need to do is surrender to him. Yeah. Trust him. And that, Trust him to clean you up. Trust him and his sacrifice to be enough for you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it just, the book of Hosea hits, I think, in different places, depending on where you're at in your yeah. faith journey. And for you, Shane, with where you're at today, what are, when you kind of read the book of Hosea, I hope people are tracking along with our daily devos mm-hmm. and reading through Hosea this week. As you read through Hosea, what kind of stands out to you as, as a, a big point of emphasis or application in your faith and walk with God? Yeah, I mean, I've had <clears throat> multiple years now of just being a believer and even walking away from the faith and, you know, coming back to God's grace. And so I look at them like, oh, yeah, amen. I, I want so many other people to hear that. But like what you said, I need to continue to remind myself of the good news, the gospel. Hmm. Like, I can't be a Pharisee. Like, yeah, I have it. That's for you guys. Yep. You keep doing your thing, man, because I'm over here now. Yeah. No, I still need to hear it every day because as I parent, as I'm a spouse and my, you know, my wife, I'm her husband. Like, I'm like, man, I messed up today. Yeah. Like, I, oh, man, I committed a, a spiritual adultery. The way my tone was or how I behaved or even how I thought about something while I'm driving, you know, and I constantly need that or that reminder. And it's, um, it's, it's been huge for me, too. I also just started going to uh, Regen. Hmm. You know, I thought like my past was done, right? But I'm like, oh no, I got some issues now, you know? Yeah. And they're revealed because, but I, you need to be allowing God to reveal that to you. Yeah. And when you're doing like, okay, cool. And then you, you're more aware of where you do need to work on. Yeah. And so how you can be a better servant for God and, and his kingdom. But it's huge. So I think it's a daily reminder what you said that we need to constantly remind ourselves that we are in need of the gospel every second of the day, hmm. that we are no better than anyone else. Yep. We are never going to be Hosea. Yeah. And we're always going to be Gomer in those ways. Yeah. And don't compare it because, yeah, it's like, oh, well, my Gomer style is not as bad as your yeah, Gomer yeah, style. Yeah. Yeah. But no, it's still comparison. Yeah. And now you're becoming another Pharisee, right? Yeah. And you're still attempting to minimize your <clears throat> sin. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I think that was what. For me, I, I think for any of us, how could you not walk away and say, man, I have an issue with minimizing my sin? Mm-hmm. Because for so many of us, sin today looks different than it did five years ago, mm-hmm. you know, and there might have been some really big things we were working on five years ago, 10 years ago that just aren't big things today. And so it's like, yeah, so what, I'm a, I'm a little selfish. Mm-hmm. I've got some control issues, <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah, that's how yeah. we treat our sin. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Like, yeah. yeah, but it's so much more minor than, and it's like, no, the control issues that I have are actively eating away at faith, intimacy, and trust in my relationship with God. Yeah. And selfishness is actively eating away at me living out the image of Christ yeah. and becoming more cruciform every single day. Like that's a big deal. It's not a little deal. But I so easily make it a little deal because it's like, well, it's not blank, you know. Mm -hmm. And there was just this sense in me after hearing the message this weekend as as I've been reading the book, like, man, 
God takes this so seriously. He dignifies me in taking this so seriously because he cares about me. And so I, I want to stop minimizing sin in my life and saying, it's exhausting to care about sin the way God cares about sin. It is, yeah. It is exhausting. When you start caring in your life about the way, about your sin, the way God cares about it, it's like, oh, like this feels puny, you know, like Mm -hmm. it feels, but it's a big deal, you know, and I want to say, oh, it's not that big of a deal and just move on with my day, but it's a big deal. And so coming back and, and opening myself again, day over day, moment of sin by moment of sin to say, oh Lord, I'm so in need of your grace and your mercy and I want to live more and more like Jesus. Mm -hmm. I know that I am the one who continues to wander and to run. Would you help me? Would your spirit empower me to live more righteously? Would you invade and pervade these areas of sin in my life and produce righteous things, produce the fruit of the spirit in these areas? Mm -hmm. Um, So that's hard, you know, and I've had good seasons of that where I've been like on it. Um, But it was a, it was a good reminder of like, man, I, I, I want to not make little of my sin. I want to take it seriously the way God takes it seriously. Yeah. And, um, and I was just reminded as Eric was talking about when he first came across this book, I remember coming across this book in high school and just being like so lit up and passionate about it. I just wanted to like preach it to everybody because it was just this like beautiful story, beautiful representation of the gospel. You know, like I can't believe I didn't know this was in here in the Old Testament and now it's become like Hosea, you know, and it's yeah. like I was just reminded, man, I want that passion for the beauty of the gospel to stay fresh in my life and not be like, yeah, you know, it was like this prostitute. And it's like, are you kidding? Like, this is crazy mm-hmm. that he would go and take this lady out of her sin, out of her shame and bring her into a new life. She'd wander again. And he go get her again Mm -hmm. because that's the kind of love of our God and our savior who went and sought me when I was in the pit. And when I ran back to it again and again and again, continues to seek and to save me like, Oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, I, I just want to, I want to not lose that passion over the course of my life where it just becomes like, yeah. Yeah. I just know the book. And I think that's why it's important to acknowledge our sin on a daily I try to do that. My wife and I, <clears throat> when we're not super tired, but we really try to every night acknowledge one another, like where we messed up as an individual and yeah. like it kind of like acknowledge that sin, but then it gives us a deeper desire of just chasing after God and knowing his love and mercy. Yeah. And then also just, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's a huge thing to instill in ourselves and our, our own kids too. And just people we come across, like my kids, we have a, an acronym for sin. It's just called, you know, S is something stupid. The I is involving yourself and then N is negative outcome. Hmm. Like my two boys will tell you exactly what sin means. Yeah. They'll spell it. Yeah. So they probably can't spell cat yet, but they can yeah. spell sin. <laughs> so maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. They're already acknowledging, but they know like, oh yeah, because we are always in the middle of it. Yeah. Oh, well they may, no, you still wanted to do it with them. Yep. You yourself went over there and you partook in whatever that thing was. Yeah. And you're still, the importance of it. Like you're seeking something else other than God. Yeah. And that's sinful. And there's going to be a negative outcome for that. It's going to distance yourself from God. Clearly it does. That's why we are separated from God. But it's also going to make it more callous to, you know, come to God. Yeah. And those are huge things. But when you acknowledge your sin, like you said, it's going to hopefully, and I pray for this too, you have a deeper desire to read God's word. Yeah. Come to him more and more. Like, man, Lord, I need you. Yeah. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. And as we read that, we're like, oh, man, we're bad. Yeah. Like, we need God. Yeah. It should grow your understanding of the depth of your need mm-hmm. for Him. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Well, thank you, man. Thanks for taking the time. Oh, thanks that's for good. having me. It's always fun. Yeah. Fun to talk about it. Uh, hopefully, this has been an encouraging conversation for you. Uh, as always, don't forget to uh, subscribe so that you get future videos from us. Uh, maybe leave a comment with something you're taking away from this weekend. And maybe share this with a friend if this was encouraging to you and your faith. Um, but that's all we have for this week on Tangible Takeaways. We'll catch you guys next week.